Okay. All right, as you all find your way in and find your food, I'm going to get us started. Uh, I'm Jürgen Onutzer. I'm the chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and I'm happy to uh, welcome our special grand round speaker today, uh, Dr. Bill Kremen. Uh, Bill is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at UC San Diego. Uh, he directs the Twin Research Laboratory and a Center for Behavioral Genomics, and he's going to talk with us today about his work in behavior genetics of cognitive and brain aging. And I want to welcome Bill and thank him for coming up and very much look forward to his presentation. Thanks very much. I mean, uh, it's nice to be here again. I was here late April. Uh, I actually uh, gave a talk uh, with a lot of the same information at the, the VA uh, last time I was here. So if people heard that talk, you know, you, there's a few new things, but you might want to use this time to take a little power nap or something. <laughs> um, so um, what I want to do is kind of give you a, a tour through what I've been doing for the last, say, dozen years or so, which is work on what we call the VETSA, Vietnam Era Twin Study of Aging. So what is VETSA? It's a set of behavior genetic twin studies of cognitive and brain aging. And the twins are from what's called the Vietnam Era Twin Registry, and actually the headquarters of the, the vet registry are right here at the VA in Seattle. We've been working with uh, Nick Smith, the director of the registry, and his colleagues for, for many years. Um, some new additions to our study is uh, in the next month or so, we should have finally uh, uh, genome-wide genotyping data. And um, in the next wave of the study, which should start late this year, uh, we're going to have a strong focus in looking at biomarkers for mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. Um, and um, so this is a veteran sample, but I, people often think, well, that means it's a very idiosyncratic group. But I do want to point out that um, if you look at CDC data for medical conditions and lifestyle factors, that the group is very similar to American men in this age range. So they're a pretty representative sample. And actually, they're just a bunch of middle-aged men who live all over the United States now. So um, in wave one of the study, basically most everyone was in their 50s. Four subjects actually turned 60 by the time they came to the lab. In wave two, it's almost six years later, the average age is 62. Wave three should be starting later this year, and the average age will be about 67, 68. There's about 1,400 twins altogether. Uh, with a little over a thousand who have data at both time points. And as you can see, there's also a large number of the, the subjects who have neuroimaging and neuroendocrine data. And from previous studies that they participated in, we have um, data from all of these different time points over the adult life course. So the major goals of the project are one, to elucidate cognitive and other aging trajectories. So basically what I'm talking about is elucidating the heterogeneity of cognitive aging. And we're well positioned to do that because we have a, a large sample, but with a very narrow age range, only about a nine-year age range, so that um, we can look at people pretty similar in age, but really have a lot of power to look at individual differences in change over time. And the other strong focus of the study is on early identification of MCI and Alzheimer's disease. And we're well positioned to do that because we have this baseline where subjects are very well characterized in midlife when they're only in their 50s. Uh, and then in addition, another thing we started at time two, since this is a veteran sample, uh, we started looking at PTSD and PTSD symptoms and more stress responsivity in general and how that's related to aging. So before I get going on substantive findings, I need to give you what I call my mini tutorial in the twin method because it's something that very few people outside of the twin research world are familiar with. So just give you the gist of, of how it works, the logic behind this approach. So we start with identical twins, what we call MZs, and we ask what makes them similar. So the fact that they share 100% of their genes, that they share 100% of the shared environment. Then we ask, what makes them different? Well, the only thing that can make MZ twins different is unique environmental influences. Then 
we look at DZ twins, fraternal twins. We ask what makes them similar. On average, they share 50% of their genes. They also share 100% shared environment. What makes them different? The other 50% of their genes that they don't share and unique environmental influences. So nature has given us this nice quantitative two-to-one relationship in the amount of shared genes, 100% versus 50%. And that's the crux of what enables us to um, do our modeling and twin method. So basically what we're doing is we're comparing the similarity um, within MZ twin pairs and within DZ twin pairs. And we can do some fancy algebra um, to use that information to determine the proportion of variance due to additive genetic influences, common environmental influences, and unique environmental influences. So we're able to decompose these three components of variance for whatever phenotype we're looking at. Okay, so now I'm going to sort of tell you about some of substantive work. And I want to start out with some basic science work that we've been doing to try to get a handle on the genetics of brain structure um, so that we can understand how that's related to genetics of cognitive and brain aging. So we started out with looking at um, this thing called the radial unit hypothesis. Um, and this Pascal Rakic developed this model of development of cortical thickness and surface area. So basically, you can see here the number of neurons in a cortical column determines the thickness. The number of columns is the surface area. And what Rakit showed is that um, the surface area and thickness come about as a function of two relatively independent developmental processes. So we asked, um, well, are those processes relatively genetically independent? So we did twin analysis, and in fact, we showed that, yeah, overall cortical thickness and surface area are genetically distinct. So it's different genes, different sets of genes that influence surface area and thickness. And this had a pretty strong impact on the field in terms of how people are conducting um, MRI studies of the cortex, particularly genetically informative studies. So. There's a bit of an exaggeration, but maybe not that much. That, so particularly if you look interested in genetics, what we're saying is you don't want to look at cortical volume as a phenotype because it conflates two very different sets of genetic influences. So you really need to look at surface area and thickness separately to understand the genetics. And more and more studies these days are doing just that rather than looking at cortical volumes. So further work in looking at the um, genetics of cortical surface area, what, what I'm showing you here is this simplification of what we do in uh, free surfer. You can think of it as if we create a cortical surface by having this um, contiguous um, mesh of all these little triangles, these vertices, um, right? And there are like hundreds of thousands of them that create the cortex. And so you can think of if you matched each subject to a template and then see how much does each vertex, each triangle need to be expanded or contracted to fit the template, you get a vertex by vertex index of area expansion contraction. Okay. So what we, oh, okay, so before I continue on this, I'm sorry, I need to tell you one more little thing about the twin method. So I know phenotypic correlation, that's the correlation we all look at in our research. Correlations about the shared variance between two variables, two phenotypes. What you probably don't think about is that when you look at a correlation, it's really a composite of the shared genetic and shared environmental variance between those two measures. But you can't separate out the two. But since, remember, I explained how we can decompose those components of variance, so we can do that with the twin method. And I'm going to be talking about something called the genetic correlation. It's just like the phenotypic correlation, except it's only representing the shared genetic variance between two phenotypes. So in essence, it's telling us to what extent do the same genetic factors influence both phenotypes. So it's kind of a measure of pleiotropy. So now what we did is we, we calculated the genetic correlation between the area of each vertex and the cortex and every other cortex. So we have this correlation matrix of thousands and thousands and thousands of correlations. And then we applied fuzzy clustering to it. So fuzzy clustering is this algorithm where it's going to create clusters that then in this genetic analysis are going to maximize the similarity of genetic influences within clusters 
minimize the similarity of genetic influences between clusters. And we use something called a silhouette coefficient to determine well, what's the right number of clusters, what best fits the data. And the models show that 12 clusters best fit the data. And here are the clusters. So this is really the first brain atlas that's based on genetically defined regions. As opposed to all other brain atlases, like Brodmann areas, are based on structure and function. But the idea is this, because it's genetically defined, may be more useful for gene association studies um, because the, the genetics may not correspond to the traditional so-called gyral boundaries. The other thing that I, I think is really amazing is that this correlation matrix, so you have these thousands of correlations, there's no spatial information whatsoever in the correlation matrix. But yet, we end up with these spatially and neuroanatomically meaningful clusters. So it's quite interesting, I think. Um, and then in this Nature Communications paper, we've just begun to do a little work in looking at how um, these clusters are related to genes or SNPs. And this data, not VETSA data, but from other studies with SNP data. Um, and so one of the first things we've found is that if you look at SNPs in evolutionarily more conserved regions of the genome, they seem to exert more influences on several allocortical regions, including hippocampus. The less conserved SNPs, which are the more human-specific SNPs, a greater effect on dorsolateral, prefrontal, and occipital regions, regions that are well um, developed in, in primates. And, and now we're um, beginning to work on looking at this, how SNPs are related to these different regions in, in the Enigma Consortium, which is this gigantic international consortium of uh, genetic and neuroimaging data in about, I don't know, 50,000 brains. So other work that we did looking at surface area was based on this animal model work. So this is from a mouse study. It's a very interesting phenomenon. If you increase the expression of certain genes in this example, this FGF8 transcription factor, you get this very interesting phenomenon where this increasing the expression of this gene causes the area of the anterior part of the cortex to expand, but the same genes cause the posterior part of the cortex to contract. So it's something called the anterior-posterior gradient. So we asked, does this AP gradient, is it present in humans? But of course, we can't alter the gene expression in the brain of living humans, so we use the twin method to look at our genetic correlations to see if we get this AP gradient. And in fact, we did. What we did is we did this clustering again, but we constrained it to get only two clusters. And what you see is exactly this anterior-posterior gradient. So the blue, the positive genetic correlations are saying that the, the genes in those areas are causing that, those anterior areas to expand. The same genes, the negative correlation in the <coughs> posterior red areas are causing the posterior areas to get smaller. Then we asked, well, what about cortical thickness? So we did the same clustering, same analysis, but now we're looking at the thickness of each of these vertices, each of these little triangles, rather than the area. And what we found, very interesting, is essentially orthogonal pattern where we see this dorsal ventral gradient. So we're beginning to tell some things, it's kind of these complex genetic relationships that have underpinnings of surface area and thickness. And then what we're wanting to do is then look at, okay, well, how does this relate to cognition, cognitive aging, and brain aging? So we're starting to do that. Here's the, the same gene, the same gene doing both of those? We don't know what the genes are based oh. on this data because using the twin method, the genes are anonymous. Okay. So we need, that's where we need to apply this to look at the SNPs to see what are the genes. So in this paper, we looked at global cortical, um, global total surface area and mean cortical thickness and the relation to general cognitive ability. That's what GCA is about. And we found that it's cortical surface area that really drives the association with cognitive ability, not thickness. And that relationship was um, almost all due to the genetic association between the two. Now, what we're doing 
um, what we started to do more recently, is we're interested in the relative, the region-specific patterns. And so here we're looking at relative cortical surface area, adjusting for global, adjusting for total surface area, and relative thickness, adjusting for mean thickness. So we can get these region-specific patterns adjusting for the global effects. And then what we see is this very interesting pattern. So these are maps of the genetic correlations with overall cognitive ability. So you see here in these orange, yellow, red areas means that greater surface area is in those regions is associated with higher cognitive ability. And it's, this is genetically driven. But in this central region, losing my, my pointer here, um, I don't know where it is. Oops. Okay. Anyway, oh, thank you. Okay, thanks. So, in the central region here, it's negatively correlated. So, smaller surface area in the central region is associated with better, higher cognitive ability. For thickness, we see pretty much the inverse pattern. Thinner cortex in the anterior region, thicker cortex in the central regions associated with higher cognitive ability. So what we're finding is it's not just the way we usually think about these brain cognitive relationships, as bigger is better. But instead we're seeing it's this complex configuration being bigger in the right places and smaller in the right places. So it's very interesting if you think about it, um, we think about the fact that, for example, men have bigger brains than women, definitely not smarter than women. But why is that? Well, this is a way to account for that um, in that it sense that it's not just the absolute size, but um, it seems like the configuration is very important. And now, one of the things we want to do, well, a couple of things. We want to start looking at this in relation to specific cognitive abilities, not just overall cognitive ability. But also, when we think about cognitive and brain aging, is brain aging just about how much atrophy there is, or is it more about how much you retain this configuration, this sort of balance. So, we need to wait for our follow-ups to see that. Is there a question? I'm wondering whether you think that the, 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 the fact that um, sort of your last two slides demonstrated an inverse relationship between thickness and different, you know, inferior posterior gradient, um, do you feel like that relates to what you're seeing here that some areas thinner is better? Is that, does that mean that in another area thicker is better? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, he's asking if this, this configuration relates to this anterior posterior gradient. Um, yeah, it, it may in some ways, but then um, I, I'm not sure this is the exact same pattern as it relates to cognitive ability. So, okay, take a break for a sec. Um, these are two of our twins long before they came to our study. Here they are when they were in the military. You can see on the left, they, their hometown paper got their names mixed up. They do look a lot alike. The picture on the right, actually the story they told is that their sergeant thought, this guy is everywhere, he's Johnny on the spot, he really does the work of two people, and then found out that there were actually two of them, uh, and had to give both a, an award. Um, and here they are at the time that they came to our study, uh, the age they were. That's, so, okay. Shifting gears, some other work we're doing, looking at um, metabolic syndrome components, which are, of course, important factors in cognitive and brain aging. We did this genetic analysis, looking at continuous measures of these four um, metabolic syndrome components, and we found what's essentially the equivalent of two genetic factors, so that there's shared genetic influences among insulin resistance, lipids, and obesity, but blood pressure is not genetically related to any of those. But blood pressure and obesity are, have shared genetic relations. So obesity seems to be the common factor, maybe a driver in some ways. And there is some evidence that obesity may precede the other metabolic syndrome components. Um, now, I want to show you, this is from a study that is totally independent of ours, um, a SNP-based study. And what they were doing is they looked at SNPs that are associated with 
blood pressure, so these blood pressure genes. And then they're looking at how they're related to other phenotypes. Are they enriched in other phenotypes? And what they found, our results are exactly consistent with what they found in this SNP data, that the, the, there's enrichment of these blood pressure genes in, in, with genes for body mass index and waist hip ratio, but not genes for type 2 diabetes, triglycerides, or HDLs. So that's exactly consistent with the pattern of overlap, non-overlap that we found. So in part, I'd like to show this to show that even though we don't know what the genes are in the twin method, it does show that it gives us valid data. The other thing is that we can use those twin analyses to inform and complement genome-wide association studies. our GWAS study. Now, regarding some of the metabolic components, uh, we're starting to look at how are those related to brain and cognition. And here's some recent work on one of them, on blood pressure and hypertension. And what we found is that in looking at diffusion tensor imaging, at the integrity of white matter tracts in the brain, we looked at APOE genotype, found no main effect, but we found this APOE hypertension interaction so that hypertension was associated with white matter integrity, but only in the E4 carriers. And it was only in three of the nine tracks that we looked at, all of which um, have connections to frontal regions. And I, I've color-coded this, so if you're not familiar with this, these colors correspond to the colors of the, the tracks that are shown in this, this brain. Now, with white matter hyperintensities, an index of white matter abnormalities, there was no effect main or interactive for APOE. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, with the, the looking at the, the white matter integrity, we found that the duration of hypertension or whether it was controlled or uncontrolled didn't make any difference. So it suggests to us that prevention is really important that the treatment's still not able to have much effect on these. On the other hand, for the white matter abnormalities, Duration didn't matter, but it did seem to make a difference for controlled versus uncontrolled hypertension, that if you had controlled hypertension, those people had less, had fewer white matter abnormalities. And there's a small but significant correlation between white matter abnormalities and blood pressure, correlation of 0.18, um, so, and most of that's accounted by shared genetic influences between the two. But again, since it's, it's not that big of a correlation, it's telling us that uh, there's clearly other things besides just blood pressure that are affecting these white matter abnormalities. Okay, some more work on APOE. One of the interesting things, we found no, no differences in our sample um, in hippocampal V4. any executive function differences between the E4s and non-E4s. So right now we're thinking that, okay, this, this frontal lobe thinning is a, it may be a biomarker and that we can expect that in future waves of the study that the E4s will show more executive function deficits and that maybe it's showing up earlier in the uh, frontal lobe thinning. Now, another thing I said, there's no main effect of APOE. We think that in our relatively young subjects, which is middle-aged and not non-demented, that effects of APOE are often subtle and may not manifest themselves except in interaction with other factors. And so based on some animal work that um, shows that um, testosterone is, seems to have neuroprotective effects against the deleterious effects of the APOE4 allele, we, we had hypothesized this APOE testosterone interaction in our subjects. And that's exactly what we found. So that only the group of people who had E4 alleles and low testosterone, who had both, had smaller hippocampal volumes. And we see, 
One second, we see the same pattern for verbal memory. It's only the people with both that have poor verbal memory. Yeah, question. Regarding mail, I assume that you're just looking at males? Yes, just, just looking at males. Yes. Not yet. We're actually starting to work on developing a gene expression study. Um, also, we're, we're going to be looking at, we want to look at the androgen receptor gene, which we think modulates this. And there's evidence that um, differences in androgen receptor um, gene variants um, affects memory in women as well. So we think that there's going to be a story with, with women also. Another thing, looking at APOE, we looked at PTSD symptoms, APOE and dementia. So we all know that A4, APOE4 allele is associated with increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, there's also evidence that PTSD is associated with increased risk for dementia and Alzheimer's. So we asked the question, does having an APOE4 allele increase your risk for PTSD or PTSD symptoms? And in fact, we found that that's exactly the case. So here we see in these two figures, the one on the left is looking at symptom counts, the one on the right, PTSD diagnosis. At low levels of combat stress, there's no difference. At high levels of combat stress, people with an E4 allele are at significantly greater risk of developing PTSD. And this has been replicated in an independent study. And actually, I know of one other uh, replication uh, uh, another study in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, veterans, so much younger um, subjects. Um, uh, this is other work that uh, was done by Carol France, my wife, and also co-investigator. Um, we had data on PTSD symptoms at age 38, and she looked at how do those symptoms predict functioning at age 56 when they were in wave one of our study. And in all these measures of life satisfaction, well-being, the physical and mental scales of the SF36, see this dose-dependent relationship. The more PTSD symptom clusters that people have, the worse their functioning is. This is 20 years later. Um, uh, she's also found that the age 38 symptoms predicted hippocampal atrophy at age 56. Uh, and that's based on this score that's been validated as a measure of hippocampal atrophy. It's called the hippocampal occupancy score. So looking at hippocampus in relation to the temporal horn, inferior lateral ventricle, the idea that if the hippocampus is small relative to the ventricle size, it suggests that there's been some shrinkage of the hippocampus. So what these data are showing us is that um, Stress responsivity seems to have these deleterious effects on functioning, quality of life, and on brain structure, even decades after onset of the traumatic experiences. And the other interesting thing is that if we exclude people with a PTSD diagnosis, so we're just looking at sub-threshold, sub-clinical symptoms, all these effects are still significant. So it's suggesting that even mild PT, post-traumatic stress symptoms um, have negative effects on outcomes and functioning in later life and very long lasting. Yeah, Debbie. So how about um, with combat exposure alone? Like, um, actually, we're finding um, no that it, combat exposure alone does not seem to be associated with these, symptom, with these outcomes, that the symptoms are associated with the outcomes. So it looks like Combat exposure is associated with the symptoms, and that then leads to the results in the poor outcomes. But th there's not a direct correlation between the combat exposure and the symptoms. So it, it's not the stress, or it's the person's response and their responsivity to stress. And then this may be important for aging and Alzheimer's, because we know that um, stress uh, is definitely a factor in, in that. Okay, so another slide I always like to show people, um, thinking about how different, how, this is my reminder that of how important it is to be scientific and to test zygosity to determine whether people are MZ or DZ twins. Because as you can see, you know, it's really hard to tell who's MZ and who's DZ.
And in fact, if you tried to guess, you would all be wrong because these are not twins. And in fact, these pairs of people are not even related. They're completely unrelated pairs of people. This is a, from a photo essay done by this guy, Francois Brunel. He's a Canadian photographer. You can Google it and find more of these. Uh, so these are you know, doppelgangers, unrelated people that amazingly look, some of them, exactly alike. Um, so, again, it's just kind of interesting, and, but a reminder, you know, you really have to test the zygosity. You can't tell by, by looking at people. It's pretty striking, I think. There you go. So, okay, the rest of the time I want to talk, focus on cognition. So, in this study, again, done by Carol Franz, looking at cognition and depression, we found that we controlled for age, current age, and also their... Um, cognitive ability at age 20. One of the unique features of our study is that we have data from age 20 when people were inducted into the military on this cognitive test that we then given to them 35 and 40 years later. And it's a very reliable test. It's correlated 0.74 over 35 years. It's correlated about 0.85 with waist IQ. So having that data before any aging effects is a really unique and valuable feature of this study. So we adjusted for that too. We found that midlife depressive symptoms were associated with lower overall cognitive ability, lower performance in all the cognitive domains except verbal memory. Now these are small but significant correlations. But remember, we're not dealing with a patient sample here, so we're not dealing with severe depression. Um, but interesting thing that we also found is that when we looked at the age 20 cognitive ability um, before onset of depression, um, that predicted midlife depressive symptoms. And that relationship was mostly due to shared genetic influences. So we all think of depression as affecting cognition, but the cause and effect's not unidirectional. Um, that's true, but also low cognitive ability is a risk factor for depression. And having that early cognitive data was a nice way that enabled us to look at that in our study. Now, again, looking at change over time, um, this is from, well, the first two time points in this figure from this paper published in Psychological Science where we looked at this cognitive test at age 20 and again in, at age 55 on average, 56, in VETSA 1. Um, uh, actually, Warner Shai here at UW um, is a co-author on this paper. Uh, Warner was a consultant on the first wave of our VETSA study. So basically the take-home message here, and then we've done it again in the wave two of this study, is you look, this is a flat line. Overall cognitive ability, very stable, little change from early adulthood to late midlife. And that's something that, you know, other people have found as well. Remember I said our, our goal is to look at, understand the heterogeneity, individual differences in cognitive aging trajectories. And um, what we were thinking is, well, underlying this stability, there's really a lot of heterogeneity. And the group mean obscures that. So we did, in addition to this growth curve modeling, we did this growth mixture modeling. And here's what we came up with in the mixture modeling. There were eight groups. And so as you can see, there's considerable variability, considerable heterogeneity that's obscured by this group mean stability. And the variability of the trajectories is significant, and it's significantly influenced by genes. Now, interestingly, there's little correlation, phenotypic correlation, between the initial level and the slope. And that's consistent with other findings that other people have looked at. Um, but when we unpack that correlation with our twin analyses, we found that there's a significant positive genetic correlation, but a, a, a significant negative unique environmental correlation. So both are significant but going in the opposite direction for the shared genetic and the shared environmental factors. They're kind of canceling each other out to end up with this small 0.07 phenotypic correlation. So what's going on? What we think is that there's, it suggests two opposing processes at the same time. One is a kind of cognitive reserve phenomenon. That's the positive 
genetic correlation or genetic factors that are associated with higher cognitive ability are also associated with a more favorable tra trajectory, less decline. The negative correlation, the environmental correlation, is a regression to the mean phenomena, where environmental factors um, that are resulting in higher cognitive ability are associated with steeper declines. So there's these kind of two things going on at the same time, um, which we wouldn't be able to see without the twin method because that's what enables us to unpack the, the phenotypic correlation. Now further looking at these phenotypes, there's five, uh, for these groups, there's five of these groups that are really stable over time, that have less than half a standard deviation of change, and that's about 75% of the sample. But then there's these two here, number four and six, that show significant declines, like three and almost four standard deviations. And that's 11% of the sample. And interestingly, there's this other group, four, that shows a more than one and a half standard deviation increase. So what we want to do now is look at, well, what are the factors that differentiate these groups? Certainly these groups with the big declines are likely to be at-risk groups for further cognitive decline and dementia. And we want to see, well, what are the factors that differentiate them? Um, and also, what makes for successful aging? What's different about the group that increases from age 20? The other interesting little point I would make is that when you're doing aging studies, we're mostly starting at age 55, age 62, and actually most aging studies are starting after that, age 65 and up. But it's interesting, so what we think of as our baseline in an aging study uh, may have already represented substantial change for a number of people. So again, pursuing this heterogeneity and trying to identify who's at risk and what the risk factors is what we'll be working on. Now another thing we do, we use our twin analyses to do, is to look at the, understand the genetic complexity of cognitive and other phenotypes. And this is from a paper in Trends in Cognitive Science by these authors did the initial work on the Kibra gene. And what they were saying is that we really need to integrate behavior genetics and molecular genetics methods because phenotypes like, gene, like memory and other cognitive phenotypes are very complex. And we've started doing some work in that regard, which I think can inform genome-wide association studies. So here's some work we did with looking at three of the three classic memory tests. California verbal learning test is a list learning test. Logical memory is a story recall from the Wexler memory scale. Visual reproductions, visual recall from the Wexler memory scale. And we have, for each one, we had short and long delay recall. So what we see is there's an overall genetic factor, a common genetic factor with high heritability. That's the A for additive <laughs> genetic influences. Um, but the important thing I want to point out here is that where you see these two A's, oh sorry, that are um, referring to the genetic influences, that there's, um, and what you can see at the bottom of this slide, there's a significant proportion of genetic variance for logical memory and visual reproduction that's independent of the general factor and of the California verbal learning test. So meaning that a good part of the genes that influence these memory measures are different than the genes that influence the general factor in the California verbal learning test. So if you're trying to do a, a genome-wide association study and you need to combine data sets to get a large N and everybody has different memory measures, uh, you may run into problems because the genes associated with the different memory measures are not necessarily the same genes. So again, this kind of work we think can inform uh, your genome-wide association studies. Then we also thought, well, since if there's different genes involved, maybe they change differently over time. And when we looked at change from VETSA1 to VETSA2, we found first that the factor structure is invariant over time. Um, they're moderately to highly stable, these phenotypes, um, primarily accounted for <laughs> genetic factors, primarily accounting for the stability over time. But what we found, it's interesting, the California verbal learning tests have no significant change over time. The logical memory had a significant decline over time. The visual reproductions um, had significant improvement over time. So if you used just one of these tests, 
in this age period, you would come to three completely different conclusions about memory change in this time period. So the point here, one of the points I want to make is that, you know, um, neuropsychologists like myself will like this, that especially in midlife, it's important to have an extensive neuropsychological test battery because um, you really may be missing things um, and these, these measures that we look at are complex if you just do a simple battery with, uh, you know, just a few tests. Okay, the last part of what I want to talk about is cognition related to mild cognitive impairment, um, which is, a, you know, a pr prodromal phase of dementia or Alzheimer's. And we used all our neuropsych data to identify in this paper in International Journal of Epidemiology to identify MCI in people in their 50s based on neuropsychologically defined MCI. And it's, uh, as far as I know, the youngest sample that anyone's identified MCI in. Most studies of MCI have been in people 70 and over. Um, and also the study showed what I think is the first evidence of heritability for MCI. Now, we can't validate our MCI definitions until pretty far out when we see who develops Alzheimer's who develops dementia. We have this partial validation in this one study where we showed that our people with amnestic MCI had more hippocampal atrophy um, than the other um, subjects. Uh, so, okay, we show that we can identify MCI in people in their 50s using this neuropsychologically defined MCI, which I want to argue, I think, is a valid, useful approach to defining MCI. And um, what I have here are some findings from this study last year that came out by my colleague Mark Bondi. And what he did is he used this same neuropsychologically defined MCI in the ADNI data. So this is an older subjects. But he compared subjects defined with MCI based on the neuropsychological defined MCI to the same ADNI subjects based on the ADNI clinical definition, basically the Peterson criteria. And what he found is that the MCI defined MCI um, people in that group, they had a higher proportion of people who converted to Alzheimer's, a lower proportion of people who reverted to normal on follow-up, a higher proportion who had APOE E4 alleles, and a higher proportion of people with abnormal CSF beta amyloid and tau. So in all these validators, um, the neuropsychologically defined MCI is performing better than the clinically defined MCI. So we think it suggests that it's a good, valid, useful measure. Yes? Do you have any data on how many people revert to normal in this definition? I don't remember his exact numbers, but what I'm saying is that the, the proportion of people that did is smaller, and obviously, you know, that, that suggests that it's a, it's a better measure. Um, uh, so what we want to do is continue to follow up to see what happens to these people and look for early biomarkers with our plasma that we have from time one and other biomarkers. And I'm going to finish up talking about one psychophysiological biomarker that we think is particularly interested, and it's pupillometry. So this is a pupillometer. It's about the size of a TV remote. Um, we hold it, not the subject. You hold it up to the person's eye. It's got this rubber ring around it to block the light out, and then we have the person put their hand over their other eye so that the room light doesn't interfere. And you get a 15-second readout. It measures the pupil dilation and change in pupil dilation over this 15-second interval. So, okay, why are we doing this? Well, um, pupil dilation is a really well-known, well-validated psychophysiological index of what we call effortful resource allocation of the brain. So cognitive effort. So there's two well-validated phenomena. One is that if you increase the cognitive load, it requires more effort, and you get more pupil dilation when you do that. The other is when you get well beyond someone's capacity, you no longer get pupil dilation. The system kind of crashes and the dilation drops down. So it's kind of like cognitive aging. We compensate for d less efficiency as we get older. When we get past the point of compensating, then we see impairment. Okay. So we're thinking that task-evoked pupil dilation could be a biomarker for risk for cognitive decline, MCI, and dementia before cognitive performance changes appear. So the idea is simply this. 
got two people with the same cognitive score, if I'm requiring more effort, which we can objectively measure, saying I have more pupil dilation while I'm doing that task, than you do, then I'm at greater risk, this is what we're hypothesizing, for cognitive decline for MCI because I'm closer to the point where I'm going to surpass my ability to compensate. So the other thing is that pupil dilation is tightly linked to the locus ceruleus in the brainstem. Locus ceruleus activity in single unit recordings has been shown to, um, to a large extent control pupil dilation. And that's also of interest because in postmortem studies by Brock, they've shown that tau pathology, the earliest place where it begins in the brain is locus ceruleus and then spreads to medial temporal cortex and lateral cortex. And, and also tau, or you know, when you get to the point of having neurofibrillary tangles, is more strongly associated with cognition than beta amyloid. So we think there's this kind of theoretical basis that, you know, kind of fits with this idea about the, the pupillometry um, and how it can be a marker for this dysfunction in the locus ceruleus norepinephrine attention system, which may be related to tau pathology. Um, interestingly, at the Alzheimer's meeting in um, Washington in July, there was a post-mortem study of locus ceruleus, and what they showed is that locus ceruleus volume didn't change with normal aging, but um, there was a substantial volume decrease with each successive Brock stage. So what we're thinking about is this relates to what's called this adaptive gain of this locus ceruleus norepinephrine system. So in the upper figure, it shows the locus ceruleus projects to almost everywhere in the brain, um, and then it seems to modulate the gain in this attention system. So this slide is our proof of concept. So what we did is we, we gave, we did the, the pupillometry while people were having to remember three, we did digits then, they had to remember three digits, six digits, nine digits in three different conditions. That's what these, on the bottom you see, there's three different conditions. And here is at the three-digit condition, we divided everyone into their maximum span. So we look at um, digit span in, outside of the pupillometry in the regular Wexler digit span. And people that could remember a maximum of four digits all the way up to people who could remember nine digits as their maximum span. And look, at, it's in perfect order, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. When they're recalling three digits, more pupil dilation for the people who can have less ability, who can only remember four digits, and it continually gets less dilation, less effort for the people who can remember nine digits. Then, the next thing to point out is when you go to six digits, well, it's in pretty much the same order, but the other thing to notice is that no matter where people start or whatever their capacity is, everybody increases the pupil dilation with the greater cognitive load for six digits than nine digits. The only group that doesn't is the, the four-digit group, but they're already pretty much at their maximum at three digits, so that makes sense. Then when we go to nine digits, that same phenomenon I talked about, you can see people crash no more pupil dilation. They're way beyond the, their capacity, kind of overwhelmed, and boom. Except the only two groups that don't crash are the groups that remember eight or nine digits, but they're not the only groups that aren't way beyond their capacity at nine digits. So it's performing exactly as it should. Then what we did is we compared MCI and normal. We compared am amnestic and Non, and non-amnestic, but there were no differences in pupil dilation, so we combined them. And what you see is, um, if you look at the single domain MCI, they're requiring more effort. At, and these are adjusted for the, um, uh, the maximum span, so that we're not just getting smarter people in a normal group. And actually, these results hold up if you adjust for the age 20 cognitive ability. So the single domain MCI require more effort at three and six digits, and they crash more um, when they get to nine digits. Now, what's really interesting is the multiple domain MCI, they're flat. They're not modulating or adapting at all um, in response to the increased cognitive load, suggesting some real dysfunction in this locus ceruleus attention network.
So we think at three and six digits, that's representing your ability, that more dilation represents more effort, more compensation. But at nine digits, at real high capacity, it's representing how much cognitive capacity you have. So this is kind of showing we can differentiate MCI and normal. What I'm really interested in now is the 796 normals do a subset of those with higher dilation, more effort, are they going to be more likely to convert to MCI in our follow-up? Remains to be seen. So just to sum up big picture, we've been addressing the phenotypic and genetic complexity of these brain and cognitive phenotypes, um, things that we think can complement and inform genome-wide association studies. We're focusing on the promise of early identification for risk of MCI and dementia. I I think I pointed out the utility of neuropsychologically defined MCI, the importance of having an extensive neuropsych battery, um, uh, that our efforts to elucidate the heterogeneity of these trajectories uh, should be an important step in identifying who's at risk and who may be successful agers. And then we're going to start looking at these um, blood-based biomarkers and polygenic risk scores in next phases of the study, and also um, showing how stress and, um, affects aging and looking at the interface of cognitive and brain aging. Over the years, these are all probably not even complete lists of people that have worked on these projects with me, and I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Any last-minute thoughts or questions, Mark? You cited several other sort of psychiatric symptom clusters in there, right. so I'm wondering when you control for normal cognition, amnestic versus combined, do you also look at things like PTSD symptoms or depression in particular? Um, yes, and in fact, in these analyses, um, some of those things were. Um, the question was if um, PTSD symptoms, depression, those things were related. In fact, we, we looked at that and also um, head injury. And there are small significant relationships. Um, so if you have MCI, more likely to have TBI, more likely to have more depressive symptoms. But it, even after controlling for all those, these differences with the pupillometry still uh, were maintained. Yes? Um, I don't think I can see it with my naked eye, the, the pupil differences. No, it's, um, yeah, I think it's fairly subtle and you, you need this, this equipment and it really does pretty, very, very precise, um, you know, measurements. Well, yes. We were, we were talking on the way over here that maybe not so far off or you could have an app that can take a good look at your pupil and tell you something. But it's still be something you use in the office. Right, but those, and those, if there is an app that can do it, those things are, uh, there is, there are some things that show that they can measure very, very precise, you know, millimeter changes. Yes? Yeah, um, what, is there any correlation with the stress hormones and reactions? Because when you talk about locus ceruleus, when you talk about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder um, and depression, you also wonder about that particular hormone Um. Yeah, I don't know how it relates to the locus ceruleus system. You know, we, we do have on um, about 780 of our subjects, we have cortisol data. And um, we find very small relationships between cognition and cortisol. Um, but one of the things we're finding now is that what I think may be obscuring that is that um, there seem to be these interesting cortisol testosterone interactions and that uh, so the the relationship of cortisol to cognition brain um, seems to be very different and in some cases maybe in opposite direction depending on if people have high or low testosterone but this is really new territory for something we're just uh, beginning to look at Do you have a question? thank you Thank you.